Good evening, church family. Uh, Pastor Matt here. I, we're continuing our study, our Wednesday night study on the doctrine of the Trinity, and we've been looking uh, for a, a few lessons now on uh, that the Son is Trinity. Jesus is Trinity. Um, we, uh, just as a matter of review, uh, we looked previously at the attributes of deity, that the Son is eternal, omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent, that he holds the offices of deity. He is creator, sustainer, and Lord over all creation. Uh, and he has the, the rights, or I, I've seen it in some of the books I've read, as the prerogatives of deity, that he forgives sins, uh, he resurrects the dead, and he holds uh, the authority of judgment. So now we're going to look at uh, the, the names uh, that the Son holds that imply deity. And we look at uh, Jesus as the I Am. Uh, we, we had a more focused study on uh, the I Am, uh, but I want to um, kind of do some review and go over in a little further detail concerning specifically the I Am's in, in the book of John that, uh, that uh, Jesus as the Son, um, as God, uh, that he holds and that they demonstrate the fact that he is I Am. But the origination of that, uh, of that name, the I Am, comes from Exodus chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, uh, which says, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said, Moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all uh, generations. So there's there's actually two things here. Um, uh, he says, I am that I am, which is uh, ayeh, ayeh, asher, ayeh. And then uh, he shortens it here to the ayeh, the I am. And then he uses the name uh, Yahweh, Jehovah, um, when we see Lord in all capitals, but we're fo focusing on the fact that he says, I am. This is uh, what the uh, Jews knew, that this was the one true God that, uh, that Moses came in the name of so that they understood that, that, that uh, he was sent directly from God. And it's not that Jesus was only sent in the name of God. He bore the name of God. He is the I am. And, and I, I've shared this before that in the New Testament, um, the, the equivalent that we see uh, to what we see in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in the Greek, uh, is called ego eimi. Um, and it's, it means I am, but it's very rarely used that way because the verbs in the Greek also have uh, the, the personal pronouns attached to them. So that you can just say the the verb, and you don't uh, you don't need to say um, the pronoun. But when you do say the pronoun, uh, it gives a special emphasis uh, to it. Uh, that's not to say that that only Jesus ever used this name, but uh, is or used the ego in me completely. But that when um, that in the book of John, there's only one time. That, that that phrase is used, that it doesn't apply to Jesus, and every other time it does, uh, you see Jesus speaking uh, about himself and in a very uh, specific way. And so there, there's the relationship there. First of all, we see he says that I am the bread of life. John chapter 6, verses 33 through 35 says, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So he is the bread of life. He says, I am the bread of life. And as a result, um, their, their life's most uh, critical hunger and thirst 
uh, will be completely satisfied in him. He says, I am the light of the world. In John 8, 12, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Uh, he, he's not using this um, in uh, any other way than to demonstrate uh, his, uh, his deity as the light of the world. That is a very bold statement, and he introduces it uh, using those words. Uh, he's uh, before Abraham was. John 8, 58 to 59. Uh, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So kind of a lot of things going on here. He's, uh, I believe here he's speaking to the Pharisees. Uh, but to definitely some of the more religious sects of the Jews during this time, uh, who were in part responsible for uh, convicting him and putting him on the cross. Right? The, the one thing that they tried to nail him on, no pun intended, was that... Um, that, that he blasphemed and that anyone who blasphemed should be put to death. Uh, they never proved that, that he blasphemed because while he did in fact declare himself to be God, he also proved himself to be God. And instead of trying to disprove that or prove that he wasn't, um, they just assumed that this man being in the flesh could not be God, but they didn't know the scriptures, right? And, and Jesus in this indicate, uh, indicates here uh, his uh, eternality, um, because he, he, he uh, God being outside of time and space, and time just being a matter of creation for the sake of man, indicates that Abraham, who has long since been dead and gone, uh, he says, before Abraham was, now if, if you're going to be perfectly grammatically correct, he should have said, I was, or I was before Abraham, right? Because uh, that still would have been true. It still would have spoken to his eternality in, in, uh, in uh, that he was before him. But he, he doesn't say that. He says, before Abraham was, I am. Uh, the self-existent one that, that the I am is, that, that he exists before Abraham was. And that's so mind-boggling. Um, you know, we, we know of our limitations based on time, but God... And Jesus Christ, as God, is not uh, limited to those. And, and he used this, this phrase and this name to indicate that. Uh, I am the door. John 10, verse 9 says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and die, find pasture. He is the key. He is the way uh, that we come to the Father, that we gain eternal life. So, the, the, these names, I am, are not just uh, being thrown out there, um, you know, in, in any kind of sense. They are used specifically in regard to his ministry as God to man. And uh, access to salvation certainly is uh, one of those. The Good Shepherd, uh, John 10, verse 11 says, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd giveth life for his sheep. Okay, uh, resurrection and the life, John eleven twenty three to 25, Jesus saith unto her, uh, thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at that last, at that last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So, uh, God being, or Jesus being the resurrection and the life and indicating that by saying, I am uh, the resurrection and the life indicates that as God, uh, he has the, the power over life and death uh, and can give life uh, to any, whenever, not just at the appointed time, but even then. And obviously he showed that with Lazarus and that he called him uh, forth and Lazarus, who was clearly dead, came back to life. Okay. Uh, the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6 says, Jesus saith unto him, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So Jesus had just gotten done speaking to them that, that uh, he was eventually going to go away uh, and to uh, prepare a place for uh, his bride, right? He says, in my father's house are many mansions or dwelling places. If, I, if that were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you, indicating that there was a special place, and namely the, the new Jerusalem that he would be building on their behalf uh, for his bride. And he says, I'm going away, but you know the way. And thinking in a very physical sense, uh, they said, well, how do we know the way? Where, how do we know where you're going and how do we know the way? But um, Jesus was indicating spiritually, you know how to get there. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me, indicating that it was salvation in, by faith in Jesus' name and in, in uh, the gospel, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That is the way to be able to get to the Father and to have eternal life. I am the vine. In John 15, 5, I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth, abideth in me, and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. So, like I said, ego me, I am, is not exclusively used of Jesus Christ in the, in the Greek, in the New Testament. Um, but when you look at how he uses it, especially in all of these different verses, you see all that we know about his attributes of being God and all that we know about his, his rights or prerogatives as being God uh, coming through in the use of this name, okay? All right. In addition to being the I am, he is the Alpha and Omega. Revelation 22, 13, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Now, we've also seen that in the Old Testament, in regard to Jehovah, that Jehovah says, I am the first and the last. And Jesus says, I am the first and the last. And he uses the definite article, and that's very significant. There is only one first and last, and that is God, but Jesus has son, it's God. Now, obviously, Alpha and Omega are Greek letters, uh, it's the beginning of the Greek alphabet and the end of the Greek alphabet. Um, and uh, there, there's a different alphabet and different letters in the Old Testament. So he's not, uh, he's not using that same thing. So Alpha and Omega is used exclusively here in the book of Revelation. But it's, it's still the same thought, uh, indicating that Jesus is, in fact, eternal. And he was with God in the beginning. Okay, so... That he is Alpha and Omega implies that he is deity as well. He is Emmanuel. And if you know what the Hebrew word Emmanuel that's also used in the, in the New Testament means, it means God with us. Very plain and simple. That should be enough to say, well, clearly Jesus is God. But of course, there's more to that. And we'll expand a little bit. First of all, that name was first used by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 7, 14. He says, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And if you ask any Jew who is the God of the Old Testament, the only God of the Old Testament, the one true God uh, is the only God. And so for them to say that uh, his name would be called Emmanuel, Right, God with us indicates that it was only going to be God. That that when this one would come, and obviously we know it's Jesus, the the virgin birth, uh, that is who we're speaking of. And we see in Matthew chapter one, verses twenty-two and twenty-three, the fulfillment of this. And while this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, "Behold, a virgin shall be with child." And shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. It's with an E, but understand these are translations of uh, the words that are given. So the Greek word in Emmanuel is a tra uh, translate or a transliteration of the, the word in the Hebrew, the I, 
but it's still the same word. We, and, it, and this one actually goes on to uh, give us the interpretation. God with us, okay? Not a God with us, the God with us. We, I beg your pardon, we looked at the, the unity of God, that there is only one God, but that God came to be with us. Okay, he is the word. Uh, and uh, in the New Testament, the word of God, uh, the word for word is uh, logos, but it doesn't only mean word in the strictest sense that we understand uh, words, just a, a compilation of letters uh, to form a sound, and that sound has meaning. Uh, the word logos in the Greek carries with it also reason, logic, it's where we get our word logic, and understanding. And so uh, when you look at this, this word in terms of uh, philosophy that the world understands, the, this idea actually came uh, centuries before Christ to, as kind of a twofold thing. It's, it's uh, the, the understanding of the universe having been formed uh, logically and reasonably so that we can view all things uh, uh, logically and reasonably and come to an understanding the, the fact that all things can be measured scientifically kind of comes from this concept that it's that's all been done orderly and that's absolutely true it has been done orderly we can see it all the time the more that science reveals about the universe the more that we see the hand of God in order you know not everybody that would claim the logos in that way uh, would claim that there is a God, but they could at least see the order that's there. But there's also another idea that came um, around that time period uh, that that Logos also refers to the the concept that that we as humanity lives according to our understanding of the world, that that understanding permeates um, all of reality. And that we live accordingly, our even our moral life would would follow that. Now, that might be true, but it's all centered in 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 God. Okay. Now, kind of take those concepts and ideas and apply those to the Son of God, to Jesus Christ, um, as as the Word. He is the one that created all things. He gave the world order. Uh, so on that side, we understand where that comes from. On, on the other side of it, we do live by one universally permeating set of standards, but we just understand it as the word of God or the word of Christ. Okay? Uh, John 1, 1 through 3, Jesus claims to be the Logos. Right? He says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And what's interesting is the Greek, reverses those in that last statement says God was the word the same was in the beginning with God all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made and in case we're not sure whom John is speaking of here we see in verse 14 it says and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth and so we know that the word here is speaking of Jesus Christ. So the logos, uh, the word that, uh, which by the way, I don't think this is any coincidence that by the power of his own voice in, uh, we know that he spoke all things into existence, right? Um, God said, let there be, and there was. Uh, and so by the power of his own voice, God brought all things into existence. And we can see here, that it was Jesus that brought all things into existence. And it just so happened that he became flesh uh, for our sake. And then we see kind of the, the ultimate picture of God or Jesus as the word in Revelation 19, 11 through 13. It says, and I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, 
and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So we understand the vesture dipped in blood, that he shed his blood on the cross, um, that he is called the Word of God, and we can see here that, that he has uh, the glory of God. He bears the glory of God. And uh, John was given the opportunity to be able to see that glory firsthand and record it for our benefit. Okay. Uh, additionally, he is called the Son of Man. And this is a very interesting uh, phrase. This is the phrase that Jesus, by and large, used to refer to himself. And there, there's actually a, a lot that, that goes into him being the Son of Man. And it would seem that because it's the Son of Man and not the Son of God, that it would, that it would refer away from him being deity. But look at how uh, the name is used uh, in, in reference to him. First of all, in reference to forgiveness of sins, which we've already looked at as being a prerogative of deity, and that, that Jesus has that prerogative or that right. Uh, Matthew 9, 6 says, but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. And he saith, then saith he to the sick of palsy, arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. Okay, so claiming that name, and Jesus, this is Jesus speaking of himself, that the Son of Man has the power to forgive. And it is true that only God can forgive. It just so happens that Jesus is God. And as the Son of Man, he, he has that. He exercises that power to forgive sins. Okay? Uh, but he is also Lord. Matthew 12, 8 says, For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. And the Sabbath was one of the hot-button issues of that day uh, that, that uh, if in the minds of these Jewish religious sects, uh, they saw Jesus and his disciples doing anything that resembled work, that they would seek to condemn them. But the things that they would do uh, that was considered work was eating when they were hungry, for example. Right? They would walk through a field uh, of, of wheat or of corn and, and take the, the kernels and, and eat them just as they were going, and in their minds, that was work. Well, that's a very legalistic approach to work, right? But Jesus is, is the Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, doesn't mean that I can do whatever I want. He still, he, he still fulfilled the Sabbath. The Bible says that he did not uh, come to destroy the law, but to fulfill, and that was even in regard to the Sabbath. But what was the Sabbath for? Sabbath was for rest, and that was for the benefit of man. The Bible says, or Jesus said that, you know, man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. But in regard to this element of the Sabbath, that he was Lord over it, he uh, correctly interpreted uh, the function of the Sabbath in those days uh, and indicated that, by, that right by the fact that he was, in fact, uh, the son of man. Okay. Judgment, right? Judgment is associated with this name, John 5, 27, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man, okay? So only Jesus has the right from the Father to exercise judgment. We know that according to the scriptures, he will share that right with his beloved bride, but only Jesus has uh, the right exclusively to judgment itself, especially uh, as of right now. Um, okay? And, and we see that because he is the son of man, as the, the last words speak there. Atonement. And, and this is kind of a broad idea here, but it says in Matthew 20, 28, even as the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And the word ransom is the price uh, the price for release, so to speak. Um, and that's why I speak of atonement. There's another word in the scriptures, uh, propitiation, right? The price that needed to be paid to ensure that God's rightful and holy wrath 
upon man was appeased so that man could be saved. There was, there was a price set, and with the blood of Jesus Christ, he paid that price. And 1 John 2 says, not only for those of us who have been saved, but also for the whole world, meaning that should the whole world come to know Jesus Christ and salvation, uh, that his blood was enough to save them all. Obviously, uh, many will reject the gift that he has provided and that he has offered, uh, and they will uh, receive hell that they have earned for themselves by denying the gift that he has offered. But uh, this idea of ransom is associated with the name, the Son of Man here. Glory and reign. And there's a couple verses here I want to look at. Matthew 19, 28 says, and Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Okay, so that he speaks a little bit of, of judgment here, but obviously... Uh, sitting in the throne of his glory, he has promised uh, to, excuse me, he has promised to sit on the throne of his father David for a thousand years, but we also know that in the eternal ages he will, he will rule and reign for all eternity in the new Jerusalem. Matthew 25, 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And in our Sunday school class, we've been looking in Revelation. Uh, the first couple of chapters, and he has revealed uh, some of that glory, right? And the Bible says the glory that he had with the Father before the foundation of the earth. Uh, and so all of this is connected to that name, the Son of Man, according to these passages. Okay. Uh, returning for his people, Matthew 24, 44, therefore be ye, uh, be ye also ready for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Okay, so in all of its glory and all of his power to take his people unto himself, uh, that is the, the, the right, the prerogative, and the plan of, of Jesus Christ as the Son of Man. Okay, uh, and additionally, we see Old Testament confirmation of that. Okay, Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed, okay? He is the eternal king. He has eternal glory, eternal reign. It all belongs to the Son of Man, which is Jesus Christ. And in Matthew 26, 63 to 65, but Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, or thou hast said, nevertheless I say unto you, hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? And it's interesting that using the Son of Man here, uh, he asks if he was the son of God. He says, you will see the son of man. Uh, for whatever reason, Jesus chose not to uh, say that he is the son of God. Others said that of him, and the scriptures are clear that he was, and we'll see that here momentarily. But um, he chose not to say it, but he says, uh, you'll see him uh, sitting on the right hand of the power, of power and coming in the clouds uh, of, of heaven. Okay. Now, he is also the son of God, and there are things that we can see in relation to deity, not just that he is deity, but that 
that he is the deity, that he is the one true God. And that speaks to uh, not only the Trinity, but the unity of God, that he is triune. He is, there are, they are three persons, but they are one God, and that he is equal in God. And the Jews understood this, John 5, 18. says, therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Equal with God. Who is equal with God? But God himself, right? Um, Satan tried to make himself equal with God. And he was unsuccessful. He is unsuccessful. And God has not stood for it. Jesus is the only one that we see that the, uh, the Father, insofar as a, uh, a visible person is concerned, being the image of God, Jesus is the only one that the Father has shared his glory with. Obviously, we see the Trinity there. And so we, uh, the Holy Spirit also plays into that. But when you, when you look at um, the, the bodily form of Jesus being the express image of the Trinity, he is the only one that God can be equal with, that God chooses to be equal with, that, that he is able to do all the things that God does and receive the worship uh, that man gives him and God not be jealous of that. God is a jealous God, but he is not jealous of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is God. Okay? Uh, he does the work of God, and that's associated with uh, the fact that he is the Son of God. John 5, 21 to 22. At, at, For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, make, making, making them alive, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment, unto the Son. So God the Father can raise the dead, so can Jesus Christ, and he is the Son of God. Okay. Power, uh, he has the power of God over life and death, John 5, 25. See, we're all in, this is all in uh, John chapter 5 here, uh, within the same context. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. So he, obviously he spoke to Martha and said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he gave life to Lazarus as he did with, with others, right? And he has that, that power, that ability, um, just as the father does because he is the son of God. And he is the sanctified one. John 10, 36 says, Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. They, uh, the Jews claim that he blasphemed, right? Is, and, and that's to uh, verbally bring uh, someone to nothing, but, but they contextually, they used it to indicate anyone that would um, that would claim to be God, and that this was their claim of Jesus Christ, that he claimed to be God, and he absolutely did claim to be God, but he also proved to be God. We know the miracles that he did. He was exactly whom he said he was, and this was all associated with that he was, in fact, uh, the Son of God, but it says, whom the Father hath sanctified uh, this refers to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah uh, in the Greek, in the New Testament, and he is the Christ, right? The anointed one, the, the one whom God has chosen to take away the sins of the world. He is the king of Israel. John 1, 49, Nathanael answered and say, saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the son of God, thou art the king of Israel, Okay. Nathaniel is one of his apostles, a very plain spoken uh, apostle. He was the one that said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And of course, Jesus came along and said, behold, the man who, in whom is no guile, no deceit, 
He says what he means, that's for sure. The Christ, and this is clearly associated with being sanctified of God that we looked at in John 10, 36, but uh, John eleven twenty seven 27 says, She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. He is the anointed one, the one whom God has uh, chosen and given his blessing and power and authority to be able to uh, come to this earth on his behalf uh, and be able to uh, provide salvation for all mankind. But it still uh, gives indication. And when we look at Jesus as the Christ or the Messiah, you can come to no other conclusion but that he is in fact God. And that's represented that he is the son of God. He is called the son of the highest. Luke 1 32 says he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Okay. And Luke 1 35 and the angel answered and said unto her the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the son of God. And he bears the glory of God, John 1, 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And we had already looked at this in regard to him being the word, but we're looking at him as uh, the, the, the only begotten of the Father, the Son of God. Okay. And then finally, we see that he is called God. In John 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Okay, and as I said, uh, that last phrase in the Greek, it's reversed. God was the Word. It, it still means that, uh, you know, God and Word are uh, synonymous. Right? It says, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And of course, in verse 14, um, it, it uh, goes on to say that the word became flesh. So Jesus in the flesh was God from the beginning. Okay, it doesn't mean that he no longer is. He absolutely is. His, his uh, reign will be in eternal, as the scriptures say. He is the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, and his, his reign will be eternal. Uh, but it was also eternal from the past. Okay. And John 20, verses 26 through 28, and after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into the, my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Okay. Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, it may seem there that they're separating God and Jesus Christ, but uh, the word for and is the word chi, and it's also used to mean also or even. And uh, the way that it's written here, that's what it's saying. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of that great God, even our Savior, Jesus Christ. So Paul writing to Titus is calling Jesus Christ the great God. Hebrews 1 8, but under the sun he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Who was it that said that to Jesus? It was God himself. So even God calls Jesus God. 2 Peter 1 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us. Through the righteousness of God, and once again, it's and here, but it, it's even our Savior, Jesus Christ. So Peter was also calling uh, Jesus God. First John 5.20 says, And we know that the Son of God is come, 
and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even the Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Who is the true God? Jesus Christ. Romans 9, 5 says, Whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. All right. And uh, that ends this uh, lesson on uh, the Son being uh, deity, that Jesus Christ is deity, and we can see that according to the names that he bears. All right. Uh, let me stop sharing this real quick. Uh, God bless you all. I pray that this lesson has uh, been a, a blessing and a challenge to you. Uh, and once again, you know, it, it sometimes it's hard when you're looking at the scriptures this way to make application. But let me just put it this way, that, that we, we study these things systematically like this so that we can uh, keep an understanding and, uh, you know, so that when we're faced with, with things to where we need to be reminded of them, uh, then, then uh, we can go back and, and look at those things and study them and be reminded. Like, for example, uh, right now, it's important to understand that Jesus is, in fact, God. Right? He is our Savior. He is how God has been represented to man on this earth. Uh, and during times like this, we need to be reminded of that. But additionally, salvation hangs on the fact that Jesus is who he said he was. And he was, in fact, God. Right? Um, Jesus asked his disciples, whom do men say I am? And they say, well, they think you're one of the prophets. And they named a couple. Jesus says, who do you say I am? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but, but the spirit of God. Okay. So um, when someone truly has salvation and by virtue of that has the spirit of God allowing us to discern and understand uh, the word of God, which is exclusively uh, understood spiritually, uh, then we can come to this understanding that Jesus is, is in fact deity. And there, but you know, it's been settled for me. But hey, let's let's continue to look at this because the more that we have, the more that we can speak to people. Because we're going to be uh, confronted by people on occasion. Some of them come to our doors periodically, who are going to claim that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. I mean, they won't come right out and say it but it is a core doctrine of their, of their theology um, that they don't believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. But if, if God, Christ was not deity, then he could not be uh, the, the one whom God has chosen, the Father has chosen to be able to take away the sins of the world. Right? Only God could have done that. And, and clearly the scriptures indicate that. So um, from, there's plenty more applications of all of these things. Um, so, you know, and, and possibly in ways that I don't even understand, and I can't really tell you at this point, but hold on to these things, study them, and and uh, when the time is right, the Lord will, will bring those things to remembrance by way of the Holy Spirit, as he says uh, he would in the scriptures. Uh, thank you for your attention. God bless you all.